which signaled to me that it wasn't there for a particular event, it was just there forever. And not only would it be there circling over my head all day while I'm trying to like have a peaceful time with my family, but they would get out the bullhorn and actually say, okay, uh, we're looking for a black male between the height of two feet and seven foot eight tall that breathes with his lungs, that, that thinks and walks. That's the type of shit. I would, and then they would mix in over looking for a missing black kid, queen, whatever, just to make everybody feel like they serve some sort of purpose. If you're looking for a missing child, get the fuck out of the ghetto bird and come talk to somebody. Yeah. Right? But that's not where. That's not what the police department is for. Um, and so you know. Let, and, and just to say again, and I mentioned Mike Brown's mom, Leslie McSpadden, when she came back from a visit to the United Nations in Europe the other day, before the decision even came down. Um, that turned her son's legal lynching into, in white supremacist legal terms, is called a justifiable homicide. Um, before that decision came down, uh, she, she was interviewed and they asked her, they said, so what's up, how was the UN trip, what do you have to say, Ms. McSpadden? And she said that what happened to my son, what happened to Michael, is something that has been going on for hundreds of years. And I saw even some of the, the pieces up there on the wall dealt with that long trajectory. What, what, you know, the election of Obama, you, the media tried to use a trickery and, t and teach us that it meant that all that stuff in the past was in the past and dead. What happened to Mike Brown exemplifies the, the, the lie that people have been telling about we live in a supposedly post-racial society now because we have a black president. One really famous professor came to UCSD a while back and named Ruth Wilson Gilmore. You should read her work on the prison industrial complex. I see many of you taking notes. That's really good because you will, I will ask you, I will be assigning some homework. Yeah. <laughs> um, and she said, in terms of this myth, mytho mythological thing of a black man being in a White House and everything being okay, I mean, people from other countries in the third world and the global south know all too well about the fact of having a black or brown or indigenous person, which is less frequent, in a position of power does not, does, has nothing to do with whether people are getting justice collectively. I mean, look at all the former colonized places on the earth where black and brown puppets were installed. You can look currently in Iraq, but look at places like the Congo. Anybody remember that fight between uh, Muhammad Ali and George Foreman, the rumble in the jungle? You ever heard of that fight? When we were king? The movie with Will Smith playing Muhammad Ali. Did anybody see that? Yeah. Well, what they don't tell you in that movie is that that all was done under the watchful eye of one of the most vicious dictators in world history that was installed by the CIA named Mobutu, that was installed by the CIA after they organized the murder of Patrice Lumumba, one of the most important revolutionaries of the 20th century. The CIA organized his murder. Why? because he wanted the freedom of his people to have freedom from colonialism. It's very simple. Um, sometimes we get a little too complex in our analysis. It was very simple. He wanted everybody to have an equal opportunity, equal land, equal possession of land and the resources of his country. And for the United States, that was a crime that had to be dealt with in the form of killing him and then installing a dictator. So Ruth Wilson Gilmore said, in terms of our um, sitting uh, imperial president, that you can't talk about this being a post-racial society because we, you have to do the math. One black man in the White House and nearly a million black men in the big house. What is the big house? The prison. So when you do that math, what you come out with on the other side of the equal side? What you come out with is what is called the prison industrial complex. What you come out with is what is called the system of domestic warfare against black, brown, indigenous, and poor people. Um, and that is something that I want to talk a little bit more about in my, I'm starting to get really long. I didn't even get out of my first slide. <laughs> I did want to share this quote. Professor Escamilla uh, sh shared this name earlier, Asana Shakur. Um, she happens to be the godmother of someone that y'all may recognize. Anybody know? I guess the next, last name gives it away, doesn't it? Tupac's grandmother, I mean, excuse me, godmother. And who was Tupac's mother? And who was Athene Shakur? Black Panther. Yeah, she was the 
leader, one of the leaders of the New York uh, chapter of the Black Panther Party for self-defense. Um, and if you listen to Tupac's music, a good deal of it that you could call the more conscious music that he produces is directly an outgrowth of his upbringing within a revolutionary collective of the Black Panther Party, and his mother being a leader there. His godmother, Asada Shakur, was a political prisoner in the late 70s to early 1980s, who through the guerrilla, urban guerrilla warfare activities of her organization, the Black Liberation Army, was broken out of the penitentiary and taken to Cuba, where she's now in exile, with one of the biggest bounties in the world on her head. The last I checked, it was around $2 million to the federal government. And she's on the FBI's 10 most wanted list. Um, one of the reasons why she was targeted the way she was was because she, like um, so many others that have been targeted, was really about not just reforming the social system we live in, but revolutionarily transforming. Um, the idea is that when you have 1% of the population of a, of a country having over 50% of the wealth, that that's a problem. When the minimum wage has gone down per capita since 1970, 40%, while CEO pay has gone up 400%, that's a problem. These are some of the things that the Black Panther Party was talking about. Yeah, have you heard of targeted individuals? Targeted individuals? Yeah, no. people who are hooked up or tethered to a satellite torture, so they commit suicide. No, I haven't heard of that. Or they go to jail. Yeah, it's basically a, a neurotechnology that targets people, tethers them to a weapon system and then tortures them until they either escape, go to prison, kill themselves or their family members or whatnot. But it's a huge thing out right now. That's what people are all up in arms about. Well, and people are all up in arms about a great deal of this kind of torture mechanism that the U.S. government is very much involved in. I mean, half of the tax money in the United States before we ever see a dollar, or a dollar of it in our community is spent on such warfare te technology. And and, and then there's the old school ones that people are up in arms about, which is just bombing people to smithereens. Um, and we have at UCSD some of the newest technology of that drone warfare being produced right there. And right now, now that the new legislation is going through on immigrant justice, uh, because Obama has been pushed to doing that from um, grassroots organizing of, of migrants and people supporting them, right now, the way that this is going to work is you're going to see them more fully weaponized the border between the U.S. and Mexico as a part of the reason why they were even able to pass that legislation. Um, back to Asada, though. She said, the only difference between in here, the prison, and the streets is that one is maximum security and the other is minimum security. The police patrol our communities just like the guards patrol here. I haven't the faintest idea how it is to be free. And since it was an art um, vibe today, I thought that this really represented this uh, uh, cover of an Above the Law album. Above the Law, any gangster rap fans in here? LA gangster rap? Uh, this is a little bit before many of your time. Uh, but they had an album called Uncle Sam's Curse. And she talked about the, the, the free community that she came from being like a minimum security prison. And you notice in this album cover that, and you may not be able to really see it, but trust me, there's a watchtower there which con connotes a prison or denotes a prison, right? But the watchtower is shining a spotlight not on the yard of a prison or one of the, you know, a, a part of the prison complex. It's actually a neighborhood, a ghetto community. Um, and what, and I thought that that piece, that that art piece, really symbolized what Asada was talking about here. And in terms of this idea that the police represents an occupying army in our community, we have to think about the Mike Brown incident not as incidental or a tragedy. Because tragedy, you heard that word spoken over and over again since that incident. And tragedy implies that it was accidental or episodic rather than structural. Tragedy implies that, oh, this was a rotten seed. Well, he didn't even get treated by the law as a rotten seed. He was let off, Darren Wilson. But the idea is that, oh, well, that's an exception to the rule. But the fact of the matter is, is what if the law wouldn't have done that tragic thing? What if it would have just put him in a cage? Due process has often translated into a legalized death process for many of our people. The people that are sitting in reservations right now on this occupied indigenous land and the people that are sitting in prison cells. In the year 2012 when Trayvon Martin was murdered, the last big national outcry that happened, two, 312 other black people were murdered by police 
or vigilantes in that year. One every 28 hours being murdered by police or vigilantes, including a, a, a boy of 18 years old named Marley Graham. How many of you have heard that name before? You all have heard of Mike Brown, but there was 312 others, and you've heard of Trayvon, the year that Trayvon was murdered. And Marley Graham was accused of having a bag of marijuana on him, was followed into his grandmother's house in the Bronx, New York, by a drug detail of the, of the NYPD, and murdered in front of his six-year-old boy, uh, six-year-old brother in the bathroom of his grandmother's house for a bag of marijuana. So this is something that is a pattern that goes way back. In St. Louis, for instance, a black unemployed man named James Perry was beaten by four cops so badly that he had intracranial hemorrhaging that ended up, it made him end up dead. Um, James Perry, you heard that name? No, you haven't because it happened in 1966. And I got that from a book called We Charge Genocide by someone named William Patterson, which was a petition that had hundreds of cases like James Perry's from throughout the country, not just the bad KKK stuff. I use that term white supremacy earlier. White supremacy, if you think about what that means, you think of people that look like ghosts with pointy hats on them. White supremacy is not just something that people in the KKK do. It is what the United States is based on. Um, and for me, that's not a provocative statement. That's just the truth. And the great thing about it is, is that truth telling that is really organized and well thought out and articulated can really be your ticket to doing something about all of these things that we're, because this is not just the soft story that I'm talking about today. How much more time? Um, so, 313 murdered in, two, in 2012, right? But going back to 1951, when We Charged Genocide was um, published, that petition to the United States charging the United States with genocide against black people in the U.S. And one of the main reasons why he made that charge was because the state itself was taking part in the process of mass murder of black people through lynching. Because you know that the United States never passed legislation against lynching, ever, even though it was going on every day in the United States. You may have heard of Emmett Till. A lot of the Mike Brown organizing has been comparing him to Emmett Till, the 14-year-old boy that was lynched in Mississippi for whistling at a white woman um, in 1954. Look at that case. Um, but the pattern has been one that has been established well before 1944. And what that document we charge genocide goes into is how the state is an organization that, that produces criminality both by the police and the legal system, but also the KKK itself felt that it could get away with murder because the state was letting it do that by not passing any anti lynching but at the same time that they were doing the anti-lynching work, they realized that legal lynching was something that was a, becoming a big problem because by 1930, more, pe more black people were being electrocuted by the state than were being lynched by the KKK. So you see that state punishment and repression ended up being the replacement for that kind of plantation of justice that people dealt with for years in the South. So, if you're, if you're from the communities that we're from, you're not, you don't have to be yelled at by me to be convinced that the, the police amount to a kind of occupying army. And the pictures from Ferguson really uh, indicate that. Can you guys, can you women and men see this? Yeah. Okay. Do you see the police there? So it says police on the uniforms, but of course they look and are acting like a military officer. Military, occupying military army. They're in fatigues. And the origin of this militarization of police departments throughout the country was not the pathologies coming from our communities, but when our communities got the most mobilized and the most powerful when the Black Panther Party, the American Indian Movement, the Young Lords, the Brown Berets, white radical organizations all band together against things like the Vietnam War abroad and against the war at home in the form of poverty. Those of you that have studied the Black Panther Party know, know that one of the most threatening things that they did was not their afros and their guns, but the free breakfast program that they started in communities like Oakland, New Orleans, and New York. You know that there was no such thing as free and reduced 
breakfast and lunch before the Panthers did that. Um, that's something that the government co-opted because they were losing in the court of public opinion uh, uh, to organize, radical organizations like that. And SWAT, I just saw a budget for San Diego, the municipality of San Diego, the budget report for this next calendar year, and SWAT gets a lot of money. What is SWAT? Murder. What does that stand for? Special Weapons and Tactics. It's a, a, a militarization, a, a kind of turning of the, a, a segment of a police department into kind of a special forces brigade, a, a military brigade within the police department. That started in the late 1960s to fend off the wave of mobilization, mostly by youth and mostly by youth of color against warfare abroad and warfare at home. So again, this is not a sob story. It's to tell you that the state reacted to the power that was coming from our communities in forming, these, uh, in forming this militarization of our communities. But of course, in the media, again, you don't hear that story. Here's another picture from Ferguson. Um, of the police department of Ferguson. Not the, that's not the National Guard or the Army. And so in terms of this campaign of warfare, um, the war on drugs is a main part of it. I just wanted to show you this um, graph. Um, you know, because you hear this, um, Professor Escamilla described me as a prison abolitionist, and it's like, okay, the first thing you hear when people talk about, okay, could we foresee a society that didn't depend on prisons to solve problems, because prisons actually cause them? You say that to people, and they say, well, what about people who assault me, or what about people who commit a violent crime, or murder, or rape? What are we going to do with all this? What does this graph tell you? Can anybody see what this is? The lab from 1990 to 2008, all these different categories of, of crime, in quotes, in, um, in California. What is very noticeable about this graph? Thank you. Everything went down as a percentage but drug, marijuana, possession. And I told you a little story of why that was earlier. It's not just because Marijuana is such an evil drug that needs to be eradicated, right? A lot of the people that are arresting those kids in our communities go home and smoke a big split when they go home. <laughs> or something even more radical or narcotic. Okay? We know that most of the people that do drugs don't do time for them. That, that there's a, a huge disproportion along the lines of race and class on who does the time associated with drug use. So it's not a matter of good and bad people. And we know then that there's profitability in arresting so many people and locking them up to the tune of billions and billions of dollars. So the drug war that Nancy Reagan in her, in her real caring way about people from our community said in terms of say no to drugs was really, uh, that, that's really wrong language. It's a war of drugs, a, a warfare on people of color, both here and poor people, both here in the United States and in places like Central America, where you may have seen this, when they decide that they want to fumigate a coca field, you realize that there's oftentimes people and people's children in those fields that get murdered by those agents that they drop from the sky. They don't ever get the big kingpins, though, and they definitely didn't arrest themselves when they do it in. Um, when the drug, drug problem started, the crack epidemic started in the 80s. So this all relates to the prison industrial complex, and I'll just take another three or four minutes, but just a couple of things. The prison capital of the world is where we live. From 1852 to 1980, you mathematicians, how many years was that? California had nine prisons built in that entire time. 1980 to the present, it's actually 26 or 27. 1980 to the present, 34 years. Did everybody just go crazy in 1980? <laughs> Was there like a crazy Kool-Aid that got disseminated to the public? <laughs> what happened is, is a lot of quote-unquote crimes that used to be felonies, I mean misdemeanors are not crimes at all, got turned into felonies. You had the creation of what's called mandatory minimums. Um, you had the expansion of things like three strikes laws and the Rockefeller drug laws. 
that's Rockefeller drug laws in New York, the three strikes law here. You have, you have the Proposition 21 in California, Proposition 187, the, the bringing together of ICE and police departments are now under the what's called Homeland Security. Do you realize that the president of my university, the University of California, is the former head director of Homeland Security? Did you know that? Janet Napolitano? Um, Alan, Alan Burton was uh, trying to unify. Yeah. Alan Burton was the border patrol. Right. And, and speaking of that, war, I'm glad you said the border patrol because what I want to do in the little time that I have left is talk about how the dots connect. Because I really think that one of the best chances we have for liberation politics around some of these issues is uniting what seem to be isolated issues and seeing how, what are their commonalities. And the fact that we're here in San Diego, some of you may have even come. We had an action at, outside the gates of the Lano prison down here in, in Otay Mesa because they're trying to add another 900 beds to that facility. Um, in the context of them being ordered to de-incarcerate, what they're doing is trying to create a medical prison. Um, this, this prison system in California that, that had one person dying every six days from a treatable illness or suicide is now going to do medical prison. Um, so they're trying to use our tax dollars to build more when everybody around the country knows that building more prisons doesn't solve any of these problems. But while we were down there, we saw border patrol car after border patrol car and other unmarked governmental vehicles that were taking people to a place that is run by CCA. Does anybody know what that stands for? Corrections Corporation of America. Corrections Corporation of America runs the biggest immigrant detention facility in the country, right down there next to Delano at the border in Otay. So you have all of the kinds of things that will help us connect the dots in one geography where we live. Um, and Monique Al Alvarado, has anybody heard of her case? Um, uh, a woman from Chulawana? An off-duty border patrol agent who used to work for the county sheriff. So we don't have to look too far to see the connection between these struggles. She was a mother of five who was, who was murdered in broad daylight. Um, and these are cases that are, that are individual examples of a larger pattern. Um, and we need to take on that, that connection between the black and brown and indigenous and poor experience in what we do in our, in our analysis. Um, so here's some more lovely pictures. That's in, I, I think I showed you this one. This is inside CYA, um, the California Youth Authority. You see, I don't know if you can see because it's kind of fuzzy, this is a classroom where two prisoners are sitting inside individual cages within a larger cage structure being taught, these are books, and there's a little slot in their individual cage for their books to be fed through. Um, this is what uh, people from our communities are being primed for. This is the type of education that they're being, that we're being primed for, and this is what our tax dollars are being used for. We have one in nine black men in the United States between 20 and 34 in a cage like this right now. We have 2.3 million people total, one in 100 adults. 70% of the 2.3 million are people of color, and the, right, the most highest increase in terms of people being incarcerated are migrant subjects. And all of this is about a system of human commodification. Companies that service the criminal justice system need sufficient quantities of raw materials to guarantee long-term growth. Corrections Corporation of America is a company that we can all go and invest in on the stock market right now. Because I know all of us in here have stocks and bonds, right? <laughs> There's, well, there's some other rooms where people are meeting right now deciding that they're investing and locking up our people and that they're going to make a killing us, and they have been for a long time. Yes? Are those like the FEMA camps that they talk about? The FEMA camps? Yeah. What about them? Uh, what, what is that? Like, there's like all these different districts that they have in place? Like, what is that? Yeah, I'm, I'm not as familiar. I mean, I know that when they declare a state of emergency, FEMA camps are something that can be used. And I know in Ferguson that that may have some, been, a, been something ultimately that comes into play. But what, what I'm talking about generally, without getting, without having details about that specifically, which I think that what you're saying fits into, is a larger pattern of repression. That, and, and this is not me talking about the boogeyman and something that goes bumps in the night. When you, when you, when I, when you all raise, rose your hands earlier talking about knowing that reality yourselves and your family, there's a difference between what those that profit off the prison industrial complex say are the reasons why we end up in those cages 
and the reality of what we're dealing with, which is making it so that it's almost a foregone conclusion that we end up there. You're reading material like, and by the way, the homework I wanted to give you, if you haven't read Asada Shakur's autobiography, please do. Just read it. Get it somehow. Because I think that that book goes a long way, not only in pointing out the capitalist and racist nature of what was the early prison industrial complex that she dealt with as a revolutionary, but also the absolute misogynist element of it, where she gave birth to a child when she was locked up, and when she was about to give birth, they chained her to her, her bed as she was giving birth to her child. Now, why do I say that's an important thing to think about now? Because it was just last year, finally, that the shackling of women to beds during labor in California prisoners was delegalized by the state. Just last year. Just last year also is when forced sterilization of women prisoners was finally outlawed by the state's legislature because it was found that over 150 women were forcibly sterilized in two facilities in the Central Valley, Chowchilla and Valley State. These are, these are and we talk, when, when Leslie McSpadden talked about this as 100 years in the making, you can think about how something like forced sterilization fits into a larger pattern of slavery and genocide. I mean, you don't have to look too far if you want to look into that issue. So long-term growth, guaranteed profit. In the criminal justice field, the raw material is prisoners. So I saw somebody said the new slavery. It's not just that you can get a Victoria's Secret undergarment made by a prisoner or get a, a telemarketing call from a prisoner. It's that that body being inside of that cage represents a profitability matrix. Just them being warehoused there as long as they can keep filling those 27 prisons that dock the, Cal the Golden State's landscape, they, there's money involved in that. So the sheriffs, the DAs, all the construction companies, all the surveillance equipment companies, the people that do the laundry, AT&T, when they bid on a contract to supply long distance to prison prisons, why are they bidding on that contract? Because they get to charge families of the poorest people in the state 400% more than a free person for a long distance phone call. So that's the profitability matrix that is involved in this system of human commodification that produces situations like this that are very familiar, right? So when you talk about new slavery, it's not a metaphor. And that's why when I call myself a prison abolitionist, I'm not speaking metaphorically. Um, and here's some stats on the situation in terms of immigrants you know that the Congress passed a law that requires Homeland Security to be imprisoning at least 34,000 migrant bodies a day. Every day of every year, they're required to have over 34,000 people in places like that place down in Otai. Every single day, they're required to do that by law. And what do they tell us to rationalize that? That all of them are criminals, right? Well. Finally, that lot, the lie has been put to that by various organizations and grassroots organizations that have done empirical studies that show categorically that the overwhelming majority of the people that are locked up and deported have done absolutely nothing wrong short of getting a traffic. But why are so many of them getting locked up and deported? Because it's profitable to do so. So here is the population, daily immigrant population inside the prison from 2001 to around 2012. And here is the budget for that process in billions of dollars. So $2 billion a year of tax dollars are being spent on this process. And who is that money going to? The migrants that are getting locked up and their families that are getting destroyed? What happens to someone when they're dropped on the water? Or other places? south of the border. What happens to them? I'm sure some of you know some of those stories in here. And if you don't know those stories because you're paying for it with every time you pay taxes or buy something that has tax money associated with it, you're investing in the prison industrial complex that has detention and deportation of migrant subjects as, a, as its most profitable, highest increasing profitable aspect right now. Here's a picture of the stocks since 2002. So in case any of you want to go invest in the misery and the evisceration 
of our community. And we know in the last 20 years since NAFTA was passed, that the, that the rate of people crossing the border has been increased exponentially. Why? Because two million campesinos in Mexico were forcibly displaced off their land because of NAFTA and forced into places like the Maquilas that dot the border from here to Juarez, right? And what happens when somebody gets, a, gets booted off of one of those Maquilas because they don't do whatever number of motions per second that they're supposed to as human machines? They end up getting caught up in this U.S.-sponsored drug campaign of warfare that's called the War on Drugs below the border. And those of you that are following what's going on in Guerrero right now know that the U.S. is implicated in that process. It's not just some bandits that disappeared those 43 students and killed those six other ones. So art and activism, art against empire. Eunice and the other members of SAMI brought an exhibit called Prison Nation to, to UCSD. Last year, it was a wonderful exhibit. And this relate, this 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 was one of the uh, images that came out of it by Andalusia Noll. And she's actually down in Guerrero right now covering it as a journalist, the situation down there, and the uprising of the people down there against the state, this state, and its proxy, which is the Me Mexican, so-called government of Mexico. Um, but you see the relationship um, of human, human commodification over time as exhibited there. Here's a big piece in terms of art against empire. Those of you that are artists in the room, because organizing against these structures, it can seem so enormous and bigger than you. It's like, what can I do? You can draw a picture. You can write a poem. But most importantly, don't do that. Whatever you do, don't do it in isolation. This is a piece by Emery Douglas. The pig there, I love, I love Emery's work because it's very, just to the point. You don't have to like think really hard and get a headache and take aspirin to understand his art. You ever go to a museum and look at an art piece and say, I could have done that and got a million dollars? It's like a white smudge on a white thing. And somebody said that shit is genius. You ever had that Whereas you don't ever see Emery Douglas in the Guggenheim. Yeah. Why? I wonder what that what that really represents. Like art that makes no sense to anyone gets on the wall in the MoMA. Art that really speaks to the people is, is desecrated as being prosaic or not really being high art. That's something for our next conversation. Get out of the ghetto, pig, which is what they, the Panthers famously referred to the cops as. Um, this allegory, if you want like an English composition word for it. Get out of Latin America. Get out of Asia. Get out of Africa. U.S. imperialism. Um, and I have one more thing to show you, just in terms of the power that you have. I just want to show you one moment, and, I'll, and I'm done. Um, and before I do this, because this is literally going to be the last thing that I show, um, again, I want to congratulate Chris John and the other members of SAMI City. I look forward to also uh, the president of SAMI UCSD is going to say some words, along with Chris John and other folks. So the, I look forward to the ways that we, we can keep this conversation going and, and see the ways in which um, we can kind of get rid of that that invisible border between, or actually it's a visible border in a lot of ways, between La Jolla and downtown and the border. And I, you know, we may call upon you at some point to join us in something like the action that we had at Donovan. Because um, there's something really important about that kind of activism. So I, I look forward to hearing you this and Chris John talk more about that. But speaking of um, here's a little um, segment of a big walkout that students did in East Los Angeles against Proposition 21. A piece of legislation in California is a long line of proto-fascist pieces of legislation like 187 and others. Um, what, was, what was Prop 21 and 187? I get them all confused. 209. 209, thank you. Um, so this is a walkout that occurred in 2000. I just wanted you to hear uh, the power of the youth in, in action. Because I, I don't want this to be a morbid, damn, everything's fucked up, and then go home and play like Atari. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad y'all got that joke. I'm not that old. Um, can you cut one more of the lights? I just think, I've shown this before, pardon me if some of you have seen this before, but I think this woman, I just hope that, I mean, I know there's, 
people with the same kind of power sitting here right now, but she's just amazing. Right? If anybody knows her, please let me know. Occupy Kumiai land that we're sitting on right now. 